The next few years, the weather of the healthcare industry will be dominated by pervasive change. Structures, revenue streams, relationships of every level will shift the fundamental foundation of healthcare. What changes are on the horizon? We'll be discussing that and more as my guests discuss the future of healthcare. Inside the Chamber is brought to you by presenting sponsor, Naperville Bank and Trust. Joining us today is Annette Kenny, the Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy and Marketing Officer of Edward Elmhurst Health. Dr. Kevin Most, the Vice President of Medical Affairs and Chief Medical Officer for Northwestern Medicine and Central DuPage Hospital. And Patrick Gallagher, Senior Vice President of Health Policy and Finance for the Illinois Hospital Association. Welcome. Good I'm morning. thrilled to have Thank all you. of you here with me today. Thank you. So I guess the burning question that I have for all of you is what does the future of health care look like? <laughs> but first, I guess, how has the um, idea or the, the um, term care changed over the last 15, 20 years, would you say, when you think of care 20 years ago versus care now? How has that changed? Well, I, I can start, Absolutely. and I'm sure we all have our own opinions, but... You know, being in the hospital business, um, I think we used to think of care uh, occurring in the four walls of the hospital. I think over the last 20 years, it's really pushed its way out. Um, if we look at who uses our services, it's about 3% actually hit the hospital. The rest are in retail clinics, which we have in Jewel Osco's. Who would have thought that 20 years ago? Uh, virtual visits, you know, e-visiting, uh, video visiting. Who would have thought that 20 years ago? Um, you know, so much more happening outside of the four walls of the hospital. It's more of a enterprise, you know, a healthcare enterprise. I think we think about it as opposed to hospital itself. Kevin? Yeah, and, and from the clinical side of it, we're really starting to look at how are we going to manage population health? How are we going to focus more on wellness? versus treating illness. How are we going to keep this population healthier so that we can decrease costs, make the hospital something we, ne we only need when we're very, very sick? Mm. So I think you're going to see a dramatic change in primary care, and, uh, and it's changed dramatically in the 26 years that I've practiced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, when we talk about the, the term care and how different it is and how technology has changed that, how do you see that in your role, Patrick? Well, I have the privilege of working with hospital leaders throughout the state and really in talking to those leaders who have been in the industry many years, they've never seen such rapid and significant change as what's occurring right now in healthcare. And really it's what we were talking about. It's, it's this change of delivering services outside the four walls of the hospital and a focus on keeping people healthy. Now hospitals will always be providing care for those when you become sick and doing complex procedures, but it's more than that now and it's, the complexity has just increased significantly. You can also see primary care going into more of a prevention and prediction. Mm -hmm. Predicting illness, yes. whether it's through genetics, whether it's through big data and prevention. So we're going to yeah. see a big change here. So when we think about primary care, I, I find it so interesting that we're having the conversation about, you know, really focusing more on, on wellness yeah. um, so that we don't have to deal with the illness. Um, and But we're here if, if we have to. So I would imagine as hospitals, when you talk about it going outside the four walls, um, the I don't know if I use the term a challenge, but reaching um, the masses to yeah. talk about the importance of of taking care of your own health, being proactive with your own health, and I'm sure that message has changed over the years. Would you say? Yeah, I think it's always been important. I think it's, it is a challenge. I would agree it's a challenge. Um, you know, you have a segment of the population who is totally into wellness. You have others who, who don't have a clue. We talk about healthcare illiteracy. People not only don't know about how to keep themselves well, they don't know how to appropriately access health services if they mm -hmm. do get sick. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think what we want to do is bridge that gap and provide the education, provide the services, and provide the access so people can, um, again, access conveniently. So that's why, you know, I mentioned uh, virtual visits. Mm -hmm. I mentioned, you know, um, clinics in Jewel Osco's. 
we have um, developed a strategy where we're trying to get access points within 90%, three miles of 90% of the population, you know, and once they have that access, you can connect. Um, but you have to, you know, you have to make it easy for people. Right. Well, I even think about when I go to my doctor mm -hmm. and all of that information is right there. Remember, they used to bring in the file, you know, and kind of go through it before. Yeah. And now they can just pull everything yeah. up and everybody knows what's going on. I'm sure that has made a dramatic change in healthcare. Oh, the electronic medical record, I think, is yeah. the biggest change we've had in 10 years. I think so, too. Um, you can't read most doctors' hands handwriting. <laughs> uh, I try to start a patient on a new medication. Before in the paper world, I was hoping that I knew what they were on and that I was hoping that I could remember the drug interactions. Now I put a patient, I enter a patient's uh, new medication, and if there's a drug interaction, that computer tells me right away. I finish a, uh, a, a chart, and Patrick could look at it as a patient or as another doctor mm -hmm. immediately. So transparency, sharing information, the EHR is the biggest medical change that we've seen in the last 10 years. Yeah, and when you think about care being delivered outside the four walls again, Absolutely. that is so essential because that's the connector. Yep. You know, the ability for a patient to have his or her patient record seen anywhere within the health system is really critical. Yeah, because when you talk about primary care, I'm a family practice doctor. If I send someone to, let's say Patrick's a gastroenterologist, mm -hmm. when we were in the paper world, yeah. I would wait weeks yeah. to get mm -hmm. his report back. Mm -hmm. Now, as soon as he's done, I can look at it the same day, communicate with that patient, and care is delivered more seamlessly. No, you're right. The, the sharing of information is going to be key, not only with the patient, which I think is we're just seeing the beginnings of that, and it probably has a, a huge potential, but also sharing it among the various caregivers. Yeah. When you have, I think the, the statistic is 25% of the seniors in Medicare have four or more chronic conditions. You have to be able to share information among the primary care physician, among the cardiologist, who may in some instances be the primary care physician for that patient. So you really do need to share that information. And I think also with the EMRs, we're only seeing the beginning of this, yeah. but there's people looking at aggregating that data to figure out what works, what doesn't work, and how to use that when a patient comes in and sees That's their where physician. You, you get into the predictive modeling. Yeah. So, you know, you can, you know, for a patient to have his or her signs and symptoms going into mm. an algorithm right. and you can get to the right specialist earlier, you know, and it's going to develop, um, you know, great outcomes, I yeah. think, for people. And a lot of your viewers are very fortunate to live in this area. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah where Edward Elmhurst is on a product called Epic, which is one of the best electronic medical records. Central DuPage is on Epic as well. It allows us to share information a lot more easily than it did in the past, where you did, you got a stack of papers this big that you couldn't read. Right. But not just between physician and physician, between physician and patient. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and it's amazing. I think, again, it is still in its infancy. Mm -hmm. So I think we have something called my chart. Um, you can right away get your test results. And it's like, I love that. I love that. But we only probably have 40% of our patients yeah. signed up and using it. it. But what a great tool for communication yeah. and engagement. So I, you know, you brought, brought up a really good point or bring up a really good point about the accessibility for us that live in this area. I mean, we've got great hospitals, you know, very close to us. I know with the IHA, there are, you know, rural areas yes. that don't have that kind of access. So what are you seeing that um, the, the, the health care changes in those rural areas? Or is there any? It, there's significant changes. And in fact, these, these forces that are affecting health care throughout the country, they're affecting urban, uh, suburban, and rural hospitals. But they all have unique challenges. So in rural areas, probably their biggest challenge is maintaining their workforce, mm -hmm. attracting physicians yeah. to central and southern Illinois, and it varies depending on where you're located, and also transportation issues. Yeah. When we don't, we don't normally think about that here living in the suburbs. We would just yeah. get in our car and then go to wherever we need to go. It's not the same when you're in, in, in some areas within rural Illinois and southern Illinois. It's difficult to, to maybe get to an appointment. But there's, that's where technology can actually come Come into play and we've seen some projects where a larger medical center can have a telehealth program and one of the ones we've heard of within the state is telestroke yeah. and we all know how important it is to have that diagnosis so quickly and one of the technologies they're using is using telemedicine to link to those smaller rural hospitals so that a neurologist can then make that diagnosis and issue in many cases life-saving treatment. Right.
That's amazing. And that one is a technology-based one, which is interesting. If you look at telemedicine and how it's being used, between Edward Elmhurst and Central DuPage, we have probably 50, 60 psychiatrists on the medical staff. There are counties mm -hmm. in Illinois that don't have yeah. any right. psychiatrists in the entire yeah. county, and yet we probably have, between the two of us, I would say close to 60. Yeah. People in the community are very well taken care of and have that opportunity to, to receive mental health services. But you get downstate Illinois yeah. where there's not a psychiatrist, yeah. the ability to use telehealth and telepsych is very important. Yeah, and that is really critical. So when you talk about wellness, I think, again, one of the changes over the last few years, I don't know if 10 years, is the recognition that behavioral health and physical health go together. Yeah. So that interconnectedness of um, behavioral health competencies, psychiatrists, with, with the primary care is another big change. And I think it's in its infancy and evolving, but really, really essential to keep people well. Yeah, we, we've seen statistics. If you have a behavioral health condition, you're more likely to have other health conditions leading to more expensive care, more complications, and oftentimes the behavioral health issues go untreated. It's, it's partially an access, it's, there's partially a stigma still associated mm -hmm. sure, with behavioral sure. health, but when you're talking about primary care, you really need to address both of those at the same time and yeah. together. Yeah, the impact of, oh. of, of one yes. over the mm -hmm. other, right? Yes. And we, we hear about that all the time that we know, you know, um, don't exercise for vanity, exercise for sanity, mm -hmm. right? And, yeah. you know, taking care of, of yourself. So one of the things that I'd like to talk about, um, I'll bite briefly, but just to, to get your insight, is we've been reading a lot about health care um, and the repeal and, mm -hmm. and what's going on in Washington. And people, are, I think, are quite honestly confused, confused and yeah. maybe we all are I know I, <laughs> I, I never know what I'm gonna read in the paper the next day what's your take on it and do you, you know do you have thoughts about the value I mean we know the importance of health care where's it gonna go you know, I, I guess I, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot, lot to that, that question. And, and really, if we look in Illinois, specifically, over a million individuals have received health care mm -hmm. uh, through the ACA. And as hospitals, we would like to see them maintain that health care. Because without that, they're still going to show up in our emergency departments mm -hmm. for care, seeking care. But it's not going to be that primary care that we've been talking about. The condition likely will have worsened, be more severe. And more show expensive. Up and more expensive. And, and so there's two issues probably, there's more than two, but there's two primary <laughs> issues that, that uh, is, are being debated. And one is, what do we do about Medicaid? Do we maintain Medicaid access? There's about 650,000 people in Illinois that have gained Medicaid coverage. But then there's about 350,000 people that are in the marketplaces. Mm -hmm. And we all recognize there needs to be changes in the marketplace. There needs to be improvements. And there's some fundamental issues that we would like both sides to come together and address. Well, I would love to continue this conversation. We're going to take a break, and we'll be right back. Naperville Bank and Trust has the expertise knowledge and experience to help you reach your business goals. We would prefer to work with somebody like Naperville Bank and Trust. They're engaged in the community, they're able to help meet our financial needs, they understand us as a business. They provide all the tools that you would ask uh, that we as a growing business need of a bank. Most importantly to me, it's a, a great personal relationship we have with Tom and John and, and our bankers. It was the best thing we could have done in banking. And banking can be very cold. What the bank brings to us is, is that warm feeling when you come into the bank and people say, hi, Greg. It's about being part of the community again, about being a name again, about having credit for who your business is instead of just being, well, instead of just being a number. Naperville Bank and Trust, bring it home. So the topic of health care um, and what we read in the paper every day about is ACA going to be repealed um, and I know Patrick you had a very interesting insight on that with your two primary concerns and that what do you think? Well 
you know, people don't want to fear getting going broke if they get sick, mm -hmm. fundamentally. Um, a lot of the talk has been about pre, how to take care of people with pre-existing conditions. I have a son who had cancer diagnosis when he was 16. He's insured, he's doing great, but I worry, you know, if, if he lost his job, would he be without health care? You know, so the idea of covering people with pre-existing conditions, I think, is near and dear to everybody's mm -hmm. heart, and nobody wants to back off on that. The question is how to do it, how to pay for it. It costs money. Mm -hmm. It does. And that's where the universal coverage came in, um, the various taxes and mm -hmm. uh, fees, because we're trying to figure out how to provide access, reasonable access for everybody. Right. Well, and I think you even mentioned earlier when we were talking that it's it's math. I mean, we all know that it's going to have to cost something. Yes. Um, as much as we would love to say that everybody gets health care and it's not going to cost anything, um, it does. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's what we forget about. And it does. It, it is math. But let's take it down to a simple thing here. I can treat your high blood pressure for pennies a day. Yeah. If you have a stroke or heart attack. Yeah. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. So knowing that we're going to treat patients appropriately for their primary care needs in a preventive fashion, as well as pre-existing conditions, we will be able to lower costs or at least bend to that cost curve that hasn't been bent in decades. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts about incentivizing through insurance? I'm one of these people that go, look, I'm a runner, I work so hard, shouldn't I get like a perk for my insurance because I do, I, I listen to my doctor, mm -hmm. right, and I do what he and she tell me, tells me to do. But I think that might help people well, if there was some kind of an incentive. I think a lot of employers are doing that now. Um, certainly, you know, Edward Elmer's Health probably, mm -hmm. uh, H, uh, IHA mm -hmm. is, as well as uh, Northwestern. Um, you know, looking at the benefits that we provide and providing incentives for people to stay well, be active, uh, enroll in fitness programs and that kind of right. thing, getting a discount off of your premium. Mm -hmm. So I think incentives are important. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we need to take ownership of our health. That being said, we also have to make sure that in the community we have the ability for those individuals to take care of, take yeah. ownership of their health. Make sure that we have exercise facilities that they can afford. Make sure we have grocery stores in every neighborhood so that people aren't eating fast food and increasing to the obesity uh, challenge that we have. Um, limiting our use of opioids so that we can decrease that. There's so much we can do outside of the walls of the hospital to promote wellness. Mm -hmm. Kevin brings up a good point. When you look at all those factors, they probably, if in their totality, have more of a, an effect on your health care outcomes than the medical care you're mm -hmm. receiving. I mean, it's that important. And so you have to address both of those, those what referred to as social determinants. They're very complex, they're very prevalent, and yet they have a direct impact on your, your health outcomes. Mm -hmm. And it really requires a partnership between yes. the communities, the hospital or health systems, yes. and and the individuals themselves. Right. You know, you can't do any of this without having individuals engaged and empowered right. to act. Right. And I think that's when I go back to the rural areas where they don't have the amenities that we have the luxury of having here. So that probably, I don't know if there's any statistics that show rural areas have higher levels of disease. I don't, I don't know. Um, that would just be my guess because of lack of accessibility and exactly what you said, having yeah. that support, whether it's your community or your physician, mm -hmm. um, whoever it might be. Mm -hmm. But I would think that would be a challenge. Mm -hmm. So I, I look looking fast forward 10, 15 years from now, what do you think is going to be the biggest change? Not that I can ask you to look in a crystal ball and tell me, but you know where things are going. What do you see as being the biggest change, um, probably technology-based, but what might that look like? I think a couple things. Um, and there's so much change, it is hard to answer. Um, consumers are changing. You know, as people are paying more out of their pocket, they are getting to be more savvy consumers. They're incentivized to be well, because nobody wants to pay for being sick. Um, and uh, they're shopping for services, they're asking for prices. Um, that's a big change. Um, the other is having the technology, again, that can kind of facilitate that engagement between mm -hmm. consumers and um, uh, healthcare providers. I am hoping that the technology is applied in a way that it makes the whole experience much more seamless. Mm. Uh, you know, we're really focused on, we have a new a vision statement 
safe, seamless, personal. Mm. You know, and that's where I'd love to see technology really kind of, you know, hit the ground so people can stay well. I think one of the big things from a clinical side that we will look back at this 10 years from now and almost laugh <laughs> is the yeah. impact of artificial intelligence. Yeah. In, you know, and I'm not touting IBM Watson, but IBM Watson is yeah. one of them. You know, today, thousands of new journal articles will be published every day. I don't have the time to read right. 20, nonetheless thousands. IBM Watson can read them like that yeah. and now put all that information together. IBM Watson is being taught how to read x-rays so that the radiologist will actually be able to focus on other things and won't miss that minute small thing that may predict something 10 mm -hmm. years from now as we put this together. Mm -hmm. So I think artificial intelligence yeah. is going to be something that's going to be fascinating. It's really exciting. It'll tie genetics into it and it will get us to a prediction model as well as a prevention model. Mm -hmm. Yes. Also, probably there's probably a couple things in terms of the, the most significant. Uh, one is making care more convenient and kind of along the lines you were saying. There's programs that are going on now with hospitals in Illinois where they're treating patients more in their home, P patients with chronic conditions. They can do telemedicine in your home. You can wear a monitor and monitor your vital signs 24-7, and, and it allows you then uh, to have home visits, kind of going back in time, the physician, the, the, the nurses will visit the patient in the home where they really want to be as opposed to being in the hospital. The other thing is, and we keep hearing about the genome, and, and, and for years we've heard how this is going to change, and, and maybe in, in the next few years we'll see that take off, but basically what that means is by knowing your genes, medicines can be targeted specifically to those individuals when you when you're about to receive a treatment you know you'll have a better sense of whether that's going to work or whether it could be harmful for you right now we don't have that complete picture and so that's something that could occur in, in the future Absolutely. well i think uh, i did 23 and me oh. and i don't know what you all think of it, but it's fascinating because you can look and see any predetermining, you know, your genetics and what that might dictate and what you need to pay attention to. Now, I don't know how scientific it is. You're like, uh oh. But I'm sure I'm one of many people who did that. Good thing? Bad thing? It's uh, hard to know what to do with all that information, yeah, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, personally, I think that the individual that is willing to go to that next step and at least look there is also the individual who's concerned about their health mm -hmm. and concerned about what can I do to get better. So a little bit of knowledge. It may not be the best knowledge, <laughs> but at least it starts, and it, it'll often start that conversation with your physician saying, okay, based on this, should I be having my mammogram early? Do I need a colonoscopy at this time? Should I be concerned about X? So at least you're getting that individual who took that test having that next step to have a conversation with their doctor. Although I'm curious, um, as I don't know if you're still practicing, but what you hear from your practicing physicians, more people come with all that information. And again, what do they do sure. with it? You know, and are physicians overwhelmed? Right. Are they, by so much information, they're it's like missing this, the, the relevant stuff? Well, you know, it's the beauty of the internet. You know, everything's correct on the internet. People, people, I'm not a real doctor, but I play one on the internet. It's amazing how many self-diagnoses people come in and say, this is what I have. And I say, oh, okay, good. I'm glad you don't. <laughs> but the importance of, obviously, a history, physical, and exam is, yeah, is very key. Right. Yeah. So um, I, I think about when you said patients come to you with all of this information. I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but pretty sure that there's only two countries in the world that are able to advertise prescription drugs on television mm -hmm. and, and in magazines mm -hmm. and things, the U.S. being one of them. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, does that help or hurt? Because if I think I'm having something going on and I see a commercial, I go, I have to tell my doctor that's what I want. And again, kind of self-diagnosing. I don't know, is it a good thing? Um, would it change the cost of prescription drugs? I don't know. I just it's something I think about whenever I see those commercials. Yeah, I mean, personally, from an ambulatory world, you're starting to see a trend where we're going back to old school medicines, you know, that are much less expensive because you look at the cost of medications. And I can put you on a blood pressure medication that's brand new that costs $6 a day, or I can put you on one that costs 10 cents a day, and you're still getting the same outcome. But everybody wants this one because yeah. it's the newest and greatest thing. So, you know, we need to advance medications across this country. But if you look at it, some of the ones that we yeah. need to advance, we're not advancing. Yeah. Antibiotics, I'll say. They, the pharmaceutical companies are looking for drugs that they're going to have yeah. these people taking for mm -hmm. a long time, yeah, mm -hmm. not for a short period yeah. of time mm -hmm. when they're deathly ill. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess the, the positive is it could get a, a 
conversation going with your, mm -hmm. your physician. You see, you know, but I think what would happen it happens is I want that. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not necessarily the best thing, but you know, the commercial makes it look good. Right, everybody's so and nobody, happy. Nobody, when they nobody take notices it. all those <laughs> side effects. <laughs> and you know, and it, it drives the cost up. Pharmaceutical costs are just through the roof, right. um, and it is a big issue. You know, so you know, in terms of advertising, yeah, it increases awareness, may start a conversation, but can have a negative impact yeah. as well. Yeah. And it could, you know, affect the physicians because the physicians in many times will have to say, no, I don't think that is the appropriate drug for you. And it puts them in a tough position because now we're looking at patient satisfaction with, yeah. with physicians. And what does a physician do in those cases? It puts them in a tough spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, and that's as a consumer what I, what I look at. Um, so to wrap up, I'd like to hear from, from each of you um, what your thoughts are as we look to the next generation of healthcare, whether it's technology, whether you, you made an interesting point that we're in some cases kind of going back to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd love your thoughts on what's next. You know, what do, whether it's what Northwestern, Sandra DuPage is doing, or whether it's just the the industry as a whole. Yeah, yeah. I think the industry as a whole to me is fascinating. You know, this, the human body hasn't changed, mm. and yet look at everything that we can do for it. You're starting to see more and more advancements of things that we could never even think about doing that. When you look at the history of medicine and you look at some of the forefathers of the great things that they did, that curve has gone up so much right now and is changing so quickly. I think some of the futures is where we've had failures in the past. What is going to happen with oncology? What is going to happen with cancer care? Because we are going to crack that nut. Mm -hmm. And it's going to happen because we have big data and we have a lot of things going. Mm -hmm. And even out here in the western suburbs, you can be on a clinical trial at Edward Elmhurst, at CDH, you know, at the hospitals out here before, you used to have to go downtown to an academic center. So bringing that to the community is going to make a big difference in oncology care. Fascinating. Yeah. I think in terms of... Uh, you know, how patients access health care, yep. you know, and the entire patient experience. I think I mentioned uh, safe, seamless, personal, that whole seamless part. You know, I think that there's going to be technology that just makes it easier. You know, you have a navigator built into your iPhone that says, hey, I got a few of these symptoms. Do I go to the ED? Do I go to my physician? Do I go to uh, the retail clinic? You know, and here's how you get there. And, you know, all, you know, connecting the dots in all those ways. I think that's really exciting. That is exciting. It mm -hmm. will be technology. We'll have a place to help patients get more involved with their care, monitor their own care, and it's also going to be technology that's going to help clinicians share that information among themselves to help create the best path of care for that particular patient, but also for the community as a whole and improving those outcomes. I think that will be the focus in the future. Yeah, well, I definitely hear the theme technology. Um, it's exciting to see what's next. I, you know, I always watch the documentaries on healthcare and what's happening and what's changing. And I think we have a lot to look forward to. I know, personally speaking, we're so lucky to have such great institutions in, in our area and access for, for our residents. Um, and thanks for all the work that, that you guys do. Um, we'll be right back. Naperville Bank & Trust has the expertise, knowledge, and experience to help you reach your business goals. We would prefer to work with somebody like Naperville Bank & Trust. They're engaged in the community, they're able to help meet our financial needs, they understand us as a business. They provide all the tools that you would ask uh, that we as a growing business need of a bank. Most importantly to me, it's a, a great personal relationship we have with Tom and John and, and our bankers. It was the best thing we could have done in banking. And banking can be very cold. What the bank brings to us is, is that warm feeling when you come into the bank and people say, hi, Greg. It's about being part of the community again, about being a name again, about having credit for who your business is instead of just being, well, instead of just being a number. Naperville Bank and Trust, bring it home. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found the content of today's programming informative. I hope you will join us for other interesting programs. In the meantime, when you think about shopping, dining, or finding a great service, think Chamber.